Welcome back to Out of This World. I'm Jamie Hanshaw, and I'm so excited for the first time we've got Courtney Turner, my good friend who we've done several, several um, appearances with and shows and live shows, and she is my dear, sweet friend. Welcome, Courtney. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. <laughs> I know. This is your first time on my channel, and yeah. I we'd really get out of this world um, talking <laughs> about theosophy and the UN. Yes. So I, I've been recently kind of like diving in. I'm by, by no means any kind of expert on theosophy. I'm no, you know, biblical scholar either, either, but I'm really seeing how relevant it is right now. I did a show on the UN and I called it Black Money Magic and the New World Order. And I traced the roots of Lucius Trust and Alice, Alice Bailey and everything is just right out in the open. Like they have a whole website and she talks about her arcane school and her, you know, the origins of the Lucius Trust. And they're there. They have these these festivals that's like a week long and it's a festival of world servers. So this is uh, right there at the world servers, which is very much priming for the global citizen. So I've just been kind of tracing and tracking like what's going on with uh, the UN. And I've been following what they're doing now with uh, it looks like they're creating a site for Satan. You know, they're uh, yes. UN Centennial. <laughs> yes. Um, the AI World Society. And uh, I just did a show on that. And uh, it's uh, really they need a one world religion for all of this to work. Mm -hmm. And theosophy seems to be the conduit for all of it. So I've been kind of tracing, I like to go to the roots of things. So, <laughs> so I've been going all the way back to the Neoplatonists. And that, that's taken up quite a bit of my time, actually, uh, trying to understand them. Because they all say the same thing, but they like to pretend that they have these nuanced differences between each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you, you see that with the Theosophical Society itself, too. You know, there's a uh, Blavatsky and then she has the Ledbetter and all these people who supposedly had different schools of thought. But uh, when I look at it, it all looks kind of the same. Uh, it really all just looks Luciferian. Um, I don't really know how else to put it. You well, know, it doesn't look that way. It is um, <laughs> is that way in their own words. So let's just um, go back yeah. to kind of the beginning of this uh, way of thinking. So theosophy is basically all of the world's religions smushed up in a ball. Yes. Right. And with some kooky sprinkles on top. And the when this started was um, just a little bit after the Civil War. So mm -hmm. it, yep. it doesn't feel like that far away, but it, it does feel like that far away. So... 1875 is when the Theosophical Society was formed. Right. And so you've got Madame Blavatsky. She's kind of the um, front face of this in the beginning. And um, we're going to show you tonight that Theosophy is actually the mystery religion of Babylon brought yeah. back from the dead. She says that. Yes. That's very much what she says. You know, she talks about how she wants to revive the ancient mystery schools and the ancient teachings of the you call it the, the ancient wisdom, but that it that they they knew how to channel, and uh, she wants to bring that back. So yes, yeah. And so from there we get things like um, eugenics. We get things like anti-Semitism. We get things like Tiny Mustache Man, yes. um, and things that you think are totally benign and um, secular, like the United Nations. You think that all of these. Um, world leaders are just like uh, convening to make peace in the world and they hash out problems, but that's not really what they do. They're doing rituals. They're doing moon meditations. They're doing woo woo. They're doing um, secret uh, think tanks to guide culture and culture creation. They make a propaganda. So uh, this is what they say theosophy is. They say it is the archaic wisdom religion, the esoteric doctrine once known in every ancient country having claims to civilization. This wisdom, all the old writings show us as an emanation of the divine principle and the clear comprehension of it is typified in such names as the Indian Buddha, the Babylonian Nebo, the Thoth of Memphis, the Hermes of Greece, in the mm -hmm. appellations also of some goddesses, 
Metis, Nithya, Athena, the Gnostic Sophia, and finally the Vedas from the word to know. And so this is the answer to the question, what is theosophy? So like I said, it's all of those things stuck together, right? Yep. Oh, and here's their uh, logo. So let me know if you can find some uh, familiar symbols in there. So you've got your oh, six yes. pointed uh, star right there, the alchemical star. Uh, <clears throat> and then you've got the ohm. And then you've got the uh, swastika, the tiny mustache man. You've also got the Ouroboros going on here. So a yep. lot going on. And this is the kind of stuff that influenced uh, the uh, tiny mustache man party. Yeah, he was very influenced by her secret doctrine in mm -hmm. particular, right? And the, her other one was the Isis Unveiled. Yes, secret doctrine and Isis Unveiled. And that is uh, what we talk about a lot, the goddess and that goddess. Also, if when you hear about goddesses, they're not that very far apart. Um, they all tend to blend into each other. So Isis is like Kali, is like Scarlet Woman, is like Whore Babylon, um <clears throat> diana all of those uh ishtar and nana mm. the different names for the same entity right yes yeah and when when you said it's luciferian i have actually a couple of quotes directly from her okay um, she says lucifer represents life thought progress civilization liberty independence lucifer is the logos the serpent serpent the savior that was on pages 71 through yeah in her volume two mm -hmm. um, and then she says it is satan who is the god of our planet and the only god and then she also says the celestial virgin which thus becomes the mother of gods and devils is at one and the same time for she is the ever-loving benef beneficent deity but in antiquity and reality lucifer or luciferus is the name lucifer is divine and terrestrial light the Holy Ghost and Satan at one and the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's very um, close to a quote that I pulled out of Secret Doctrine also. It says, one of the most hidden secrets involves the so-called fall of angels. Satan and his rebellious hosts will thus prove to have become the direct saviors and creators of divine man. Thus, Satan, once he ceased to be viewed in the superstitious spirit of the church, grows into the grandiose image. It is Satan who is the god of our planet and the only god, Satan or Lucifer, represents the centrifugal energy of the universe, this ever-living symbol of self-sacrifice for the intellectual independence of humanity. So they are saying right there, we worship Satan, full stop, Lucifer, Prometheus, whatever you want to call it, is the true god of theosophy. Yes. And I, I think that they, so they talk about, you were saying it's like all these religions mushed into one. And, and I think that, you know, that's what we're seeing right now. The interfaith movement, the integralist movement. Mm -hmm. Chris Lam. Chris Lam. Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, I, I'm seeing, so I've been watching some, of, are you familiar with the world parliament of, uh, the parliament of world religions? Somewhat. Okay, so this started in 1893. That was like, it was in Chicago at the World Fair. And that was the first kind of, uh, you know, proposal for that there should be this uh, World Parliament of Religions. And then it, it was in 1993 that they did their first, uh, where now they've been doing these annual meetings. Mm. And uh, so it's a uh, Robert Mueller, who's been one of the kind of guys like helming this and talking about how we have to have these interfaith meetings and interfaith religions. And these, I've been watching just like clips from some of these videos, like of the, you know, and they're, they're pretty scary. <laughs> um, but some of the things they talk about are like that. And this is, you know, I I've always thought this, but to see this, you know, actually being said by them is really interesting. They talk about how it's one of the reasons why things like ayahuasca is so important because mm, it helps mm -hmm. bring this sense of the oneness and it, that's part of you know they keep talking about how there is no there are no individuals there's no uh you know there's no separation it's all one everything's one and our whole journey is about you know reconnecting to the one and that the divine is within us that there it's not the creator it's within each of us so it's a very gnostic principle as well but yeah. the ayahuasca helps people to access this and to understand this so 
Um, I thought it's very interesting because it, you know, I mean, it's definitely a great brainwashing tool and they've talked about that, but it's also a great tool to help convince people to be theosophists. So. Exactly. And ha- have you seen that girl who's going viral with the, all the dreadlocks and she's yes. like covered in moss and she's singing about pyramids and aliens helping her? Yes. <laughs> that foolishness is um, what they're trying to push on humanity because in order for their the culmination of their alchemical process and what they think is that people are going to either be spiritual or they're going to be recycled. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, And take that to mean whatever. Yes. They believe in reincarnation. You will be thrown into the pot and recycled if you do not um, match up to their spiritual standards of the UN, which uh, is saying that we think that Lucifer is the light of the world. So let's go back kind of to Blavatsky. Now I'm, I'm not an expert on her life, but I have uh, watched some documentaries and read some things, you know, about kind of like where she gets these ideas mm-hmm. and that's a kooky place, right? <laughs> From hidden masters in the Tibetan mountains, like the Himalayas yeah. who sit up there and meditate all day long and they run things uh, through proxy people and they um they visit people through astral projection yes right so it's like the super friends okay like all of these uh ascended masters they think jesus was one they think buddha was one they think krishna was one um so they're all just like loaded and they tried to make uh what what was his name uh uh jiru krishnamurti yes krishnamurti yeah. Yeah. So but he yeah. Was, like kind of rejected it, actually. He was like, Oh, I'm kind of done with you. He did I mean, he's still a new age leader, but yeah. <laughs> Krishnamurti became like a nothing burger. And so if you guys like this show tonight, um, you can also go over to Rockfin and watch the one that I did called Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, which goes very deep mm-hmm. into all of this and what the rainbow flag symbolizes. And it isn't just um about gay pride, it is actually the symbol of the hidden masters and the seven rays yeah, the seven they rays. call it of the prism or the um the the, the soul rays. of light yes yeah the soul rays so tell um, me- that's actually where they get um that so that's one of the spinoffs of theosophy mm-hmm. uh, the i am church yes because the seven threes is the from saint germain um and it's actually also i think the really earliest uh iteration would be uh I am Bilicus, the Neoplatonist philosopher. Uh-huh. Yeah. I actually have seen their passion play um, in Mount Shasta, the I am foundation. Okay. So the entire town of Mount Shasta is this cult almost, right? Mm-hmm. And they don't wear black or red ever. And they all wear the same color on the same day. And I only found this out by just like being a tourist there. I'm like, how come everyone's wearing green in town today? And they're like, oh, we wear green on Wednesdays. And then we wear blue on this day, however they do it. I was like, okay, weird. And then, so we just happened to be there um, in the summer when they do this entire life of Jesus, which is played by the man that they call St. Germain, right? who they think is one of these ascended masters who has lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yes. And and, to channel them. Yeah. mm -hmm. And even in vampire lore, St. Germain is hanging in there. Like I've seen them reference him and Buffy the Vampire Slayer and things like that. So really, yeah, he's in pop culture, but um, yeah, St. Germain is one of those characters and they do have like their own icons that are looking like, um, they can they kind of like like anime and byzantine combine it's really bizarre they have like really big blue eyes and blonde hair so that's where you get these ideas of the aryans and yeah. the, the white uh master race right yes 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 that was uh one of uh, blavatsky's ideas that that's what influenced hitler yeah or mustache man yeah yeah Um, (laughs) yeah so okay let's go back to Blavatsky so tell me kind of um let's piece together her life for a second because to me it seems like she's just like a carnival con man but she's also in touch with some demonic entities because she can make things happen what do you think yeah well actually um she was like outed as a fraud 
um, by the uh, British Psychical Society uh, and uh, also in India. They both mm -hmm. like outcasted her and uh, yeah, de determined her a fraud. Um, so yeah, let me find my notes on Blavatsky. So but she's traveling around while you look. I'll just kind of. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. she kind of um, is eschewing the uh, traditional religions and she goes on this eat, pray, love adventure where she visits India. She visits Egypt. She visits America. She gets in all of these um, adventures. You know, she's on like boats that sink and she's one of the only survivors. And so she is on this crazy journey and she's also learning how to um, be a spiritualist. So in these times, like right after the Civil War, up until maybe like uh, the Atomic Age, spiritualism was huge. You know, crystal balls, yeah. seances, speaking to the dead, psychics, tarot cards. It was a magical revival in this way. And it is rife with con men because people want to believe in the woo-woo. And it's not yeah. hard to... Um, you know, produce an effect like a, like a Hollywood effect mm -hmm. back in the day. And then they believe that it's ghosts rapping on the table or whatever is happening. So in my opinion, I think she is in contact with demons and she is doing carnival magic. So it's like both. And what do you think? I, I would agree. I, I think she was a very unhappy person. It sounds like she was, and that that's what they say. Like she died alone and kind of ill and you know, very unhappy. She was married for three months and then went on her whole like, you know, voyage where she travels the world. And she was very taken with the, uh, you know, ancient Tibetan religions and the the spiritual leaders there. Um, and then she, she actually moved to India for a while. Uh, her and uh, Alcott, who was a lawyer who mm -hmm. started the Theosophical Society with her. Mm -hmm. um, he was a veteran of the Civil War. And he was also, it was interesting because he, he was like a special investigator into the corruption uh, of the armed services. And it, he seemed very like noble, <laughs> but uh, right. Um, and then he was a member of the, uh, the, of the commission that was appointed to investigate the assassination of President Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, so the two of them like go and they they leave and they, they go to India and they set up the Theosophical Society there. That was three years after they started the Theosophical Society in New York. It actually started in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, their headquarters are in Ad Adyar. I don't know how you say it. Adyar? Adyar? Yeah. Adyar, probably, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, in India. And uh, yeah, but they, they talk about how she, and most of what I was reading was how she, I mean, her influences and what she, you know, they, the, all the offshoots, it was like the Rosicrucians are offshoots of the Theosoph, the Theosophists, the, the, the uh, Order of the Golden Dawn, um, the obviously Alice Bailey, the Arcane School, Rudolf Steiner, um, which was the Anthroposophical, Anthro Philosophical society uh -huh. um, and uh and then the An anji yoga society was also an offshoot um but yeah she talks about how she like cha essentially channels all these uh spirits mm -hmm. and they they gave her access to all of this ancient wisdom and that essentially you know everything is she wanted she didn't reject any religions that all religions were accepted including you know all the secular and this is really interesting because it's something that you keep hearing i mean they when they talk about the like the you know tenets of theosophy they talk about like the perfectibility of human nature mm -hmm. this is a, a very much what uh, uh, adam weissoff believed yes <laughs> this was, and right? they were, they were the actually perfectibilists yes <laughs> right they were called the perfectibilists um so they believe that they and she came up with like several uh you know like a founding print propositions for the theosophical society so i'll see if i can find those two um i seem to have everything all scattered so okay she yeah her they call them secret chiefs or disembodied ascended ass uh, masters <laughs> ascended ass masters yeah, pretty yeah. much. <laughs> yes, because they want, they're very interested in your um, butthole. Oh, that, that disturbed me so much. Yeah. 
You, yes. When you sent me that, that was beyond disturbing. Uh, but yes. And she was a huge influence on uh, Crowley as well. Mm -hmm. um, this also I thought re was really interesting too. So they, when, and this goes all the way back to the Neoplatonists, they had, um, so they had like, and this was from, uh, it, well, it was relayed by uh, Plotinus because Plotinus was one of the only ones who did the writing. A lot of them, it was that because it was all supposed to be kept in secret and only done through oral teachings. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really influenced because then when I looked at Blavatsky's, you know, beliefs and her teaching, it's all coming from really and what the Neoplatonists were saying. I think it's just an extension of this. And the Neoplatonists, I feel like, this is just my interpretation from what I've read, but it seemed like this was at the time. So obviously Plato was 400 years before Christ. So Christianity was not on the scene. This wasn't, you know, he wasn't aware of Christianity at the time, but when the Neoplatonists were on the scene, Christianity was emerging. Mm -hmm. And I think that it was, they saw it as a competition and competing schools of thought. And so they were trying to revive the ancient mysteries because it, through these ancient, essentially through secret societies, they could maintain power. And, you know, they, so he had these uh, di three different means of uh, degrees, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it was the neophytes, it was the initiates, and then the masters. Mm -hmm. and I think this is very much where the Freemasons get their, their structure from. And wasn't Blavatsky a Freemason? She was. Yeah. She was a co-Freemason, one of the few, you know female freemasons yes and that i one, think Leva, i think uh, her disciple as well bailey because her husband foster so she mm -hmm. was considered like an honorary freemason as well and that yeah. was big during the french enlightenment era was yes. uh co-masonry right because everything yes. has to be equal and libertine right yes so what, what we're getting at here tonight is that the un is a world religion and its head is lucifer and we are going back in time to try and prove to you that you know in their own words in their own art in their own symbolism in their um <clears throat> in their ngos they are bringing about the new age of aquarius so their medical arm is yes. the who um their banking arm is the imf world bank their educational arm is um, UNESCO. Yes. And, and oddly enough, UNESCO is one of the sponsors of um, the ride at Disneyland called Small World. It's a small yeah. world after all, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. And it makes perfect sense. And I've done a lot of work on the origins of the modern education system, and that has complete occult ties. Um, you know, it's uh, the Order of Skull and Bones pretty much exported the uh, Americanization of Wundt. Uh, Wilhelm Wundt was very much a Hegelian. Hegel is absolutely a theosophist. You know, he's a hermeticist. He's an alchemist, definitely a Gnostic. And he was very influenced, actually, by the Neoplatonists and by Boheme, Jacob Boheme, who we get the term, the Bohemian, right? Bohemian yeah, Grove. Bohemian Grove Bohemian. Yeah. Yes. And that's from Jacob Boheme. Um, and... Uh, so the, but the Order of Skull and Bones, there's a lot of connections to the Illuminati. And I would argue these are all just offshoots of the original mystery schools. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you know, you could say that's a, a reductionistic oversimplification, but in terms of their worldview, and even when you start to look at how these, because a lot of them had to go underground and you saw that even with, you know, I'm looking even from the little writings we have of the Neoplatonists, they talk about how they had to go underground. Mm -hmm. So we know that they start rebranding, they create these offshoots and, uh, you know, they, they just have a, a new bow for the same outfit. And, uh, but the order of skull and bones very much took over the, um, exportation of the education systems where, why, how we got the, you know, Prussian model exported to the United States and it was all to breed compliance. We, we did a show on this, mm -hmm. uh, breed mindless, obedient compliance, but it's, it's very much through occultism and UNESCO was definitely at the helm of all of that. So yeah, the UN is, uh, definitely. It, it's a religion, you know, it's not just a bunch of boring diplomats sitting there falling asleep. You know, when you think of the UN, you just think of this place where everybody 
is like gathered and they have the translators and they're just like hashing out these problems, but no, it's getting weird. So um, let's talk about Alice Bailey for a second because she yes. um, and her writings is really what um, is the ultimate foundation of what you were talking about. Lucifer trust, it was called, mm -hmm. and then it was called Lucius trust because Lucifer yes. was too it, on the news. it was yeah. Lucifer publishing and then two right. years later they changed it to Lucifer trust. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when Alice was about 15, she was home alone. She decided to stay home from church and her family went to church and she was sitting in her room and a tall stranger dressed in very fancy European clothes and a turban came into her room and told her she had work to do in the world. So I'm thinking, what, remember that character from Harry Potter, the very first one who had like Voldemort in the back of his head? and he had to wear a turban oh yeah <laughs> so that's who I'm like picturing is visiting Alice Bailey when she's 15 years old saying you have been chosen to um foment this new world religion but the the master he told her she had to um learn self-control and how to be more pleasant <laughs> yes, and it's so interesting because I find it really interesting, by the way, that a lot of these the, the, theosophists were Christian and rebelled against Christianity. Like mm -hmm. even one of the first Neoplatonists, uh, Adolman, uh, is it, how do I say his name? Adol Adolmanus. Is mm -hmm. Adolmanus Saka, which meant uh, Sakas was the like sack bearer. But he he was also, and he rejected it, and re they were rebelling, basically, the what they the teachings they grew up with. Mm -hmm. um, but she said one of the masters, Alice Bailey, said one of the masters came to her and told her that it was her path in life that she was the one who was going to bring about the the one world religion, and this mm -hmm. was her job, and uh, that that was the the aim and the goals and the pursuit of the Masons, and that she was the one who was going to be able to do it. And it looks like that's exactly what's going on with the UN. That, that she's carrying out the plans for yeah. the ascended master. Because uh, um, okay. masonry is, yeah, uh, also an amalgam of different religions. You can be any religion, they say, yeah. and also be a mason. Um, but, you know, our church uh, does not allow you to do that. It's one of the only places that they say you cannot be a mason and a Christian at the same time. Yeah. But according to the masons, you can um, okay, so she turns away from her, you know, religion. She learns her yeah. self-control. She tries to be more pleasant. She mm -hmm. uh, turns 22, and then she talks about a mysterious light came into her room mm -hmm. and spoke to her in the same voice as the man with the turban who visited her when she was 15 and told her that the United States is a feminine civilization. Yes. Is that interesting? I thought that was very interesting. And yes. the, the real founders were the Pilgrim Mothers. Okay, so now we're getting back to goddess worship. Um, we're talking about Washington, D.C., which stands for District of Columbia. And um, you guys all ought to know that Columbia is a goddess, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Symbolized by a dove. Um, she's usually pictured with like a Phrygian cap and uh, some patriotic type clothes. I'm going to do a show on Rockfin about the um, architecture of DC and we're going to talk about Columbia in there. But so these awesome. hidden masters are telling Alice Bailey that the U.S. is a feminine, feminine civilization and she needs to become a student of the occult. And I'm I wonder if this is her. I'm getting it mixed up. She was married once and he beat her really bad and she left him. Is that? Yeah, I think that's part of why she partnered, why she was so taken with uh, Annie Besant because she, uh, they, or maybe that's uh, Annie Besant's story. It might be Annie Besant. Oh, okay. think, yeah, because she was, uh, she was one of the ones who helmed the feminist movement. That's her. Okay, so yes. Alice Bailey and Annie Besant are two other um, names in Theosophy that uh, are so they got Bavlatsky, Alice, and Annie. Alice married Foster Bailey, who was also a, yes, Freemason. Was a Freemason. He was the national secretary of the Theosophical Society. Mm -hmm. And then Alice made contact with an entity called the Tibetan. So you wonder why 
they are pushing yoga, they're pushing mm -hmm. Hindu, they're pushing Buddha, um, all the girls are in yoga pants and meditating. This is why, because it's part of the Aquarian conspiracy. Yes. And the Aquarian, so uh, this is also really interesting because again, goes back to the whole oneness, right? So the age of conspiracy, uh, uh, sorry, the age of the Aquarian, the, I'm thinking of the Aquarian conspiracy, um, but it's the idea that everything is one and that we are, uh, you know, and that the heightened emotionality and it's the antithesis of the Leo. This is, this is what they believe. And the mm -hmm. Leo represents the, in, the hyper individuality. Um, so they talk about this a lot and how they want to bring about the age of, of Aquarius. I, I think I have the quote too on this, but um, that that's one of the things that they talk about a lot in the Lucius Trust, you know, that they want to bring about. And they have, they actually, they scrubbed a bunch of it. I had, I had some of the screenshots in the show I did on Lucius Trust, but they've, they've scrubbed a bunch of them, mm -hmm. uh, but they had a whole page on, it was on the UN website. Uh, about uh, the age of uh, Aquarius and how they they're uh, ushering in the age of Aquarius. Let me see if I can find this quote. Someone uh, just sent me this. Um, so the Supreme Council of the 33rd in Washington, D.C. used to have a magazine called New the New Age. New Age ooh. magazine. Wow. And uh, a lot of their articles and things are very weird. The, when we visited this Supreme Council of the 33rd in D.C. in 2012, uh, guess what kind of books we found? What did you find? OTO. Oh. Yeah. So they have an enormous library, an occult library, and featuring books from uh, the sex magic cult of Crowley and Kenneth Grant, the OTO, right there in their shelves. Wow. Wow. Uh, yeah, so the age of, uh, we're shifting to the age of Aquarius. Aquarius has to do with the good of the group, personal detachment, and concern for the elect eclectic whole. This is why you keep hearing, and this is what's driving, this whole religion is driving all of the, like, DEI, you know, the ESG, the, under the guise that it's for, you know, the good of the whole, and that we're, you know, the eclectic whole, as they call it. The Borg. And then they say, the what? The Borg. Yes. Right. <laughs> uh, and then there, uh, the opposite would be the Leo, which believes in the individual sovereignty, passionate feelings, ability to decide for oneself, the appropriate course of action. And so they're, they really want to usher in the age of the Aquarius because they, they want it to be where we don't have any personal sovereignty, mm -hmm. where there's no, uh, there are no nations, there's no individual, there's no individuals, there's no individual religions, it's all one. Um, and they, this is, you, you're really seeing when they, when they talk about the AI world society, they say that there will be no human government. It's mm -hmm. all going to be run by AI. So it's essentially going to be this one centralized hub. They want that hub to be in Ukraine. They're talking about how they have to, they did a whole symposium on how they have to rebuild Ukraine because it's been decimated after the war. Uh, so we have to send a lot of money and a lot of support to rebuild Ukraine. Sounds kind of like building back better. Mm -hmm. had to tear it down first. And then- uh, Which is an they're, alchemical they're, ritual. Alchem exactly. Uh -huh. And then uh, they're going to rebuild it so that it can be the hub, the centralized hub of this AI world society where the offshoots will be all of these 15-minute cities, smart cities, C40 cities, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really this idea that everything is one and that humans are objects. They talk about how we're objects in the AI world society and uh, that, yeah, so we really have no personal sovereignty anymore. That's so crazy. But I was going to read how uh, this was another quote I found from, uh, this is uh, uh, Blavatsky, Lucifer, vol volume one. And she talks about how it is diametrically opposed to Christianity. Mm -hmm. So she says how they can accept all religions but they accept that it opposes Christianity. <laughs> but it's so weird because their Messiah is called Christ, but they're like, not that Christ, our Christ. Well, and this is really interesting because you're seeing this right now too. And this is very deceptive, which are masters of deception. But you're seeing a lot of people talk about things like Christ consciousness, mm -hmm. right? This is not uh, Christ consciousness the way that Christians think about, you know, the Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they think of Jesus Christ as being one of the ascendant masters and that he's inside of you mm -hmm. and that we are all one and there is no individual. And, 
And so it's, but they're using this term. And I, I think it's really a nod to the initiates, but because it sounds Christian and I'm seeing so much of this, like, you know, this umbrella of Christianity, but it's really a mystified mystical version of Christianity. And I think that the purpose is to mystify the masses in order to bring them towards this interfaith integralistic movement. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I'm seeing so much of it. I think that the, I think Jordan Peterson's arc is an example of this. Mm. I, I did a show on that. I called it, uh, is Jordan Peterson's arc, the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship, the uh, dialectical right arm to right, to build weft dreams. <laughs> you know, it's a little play on yeah. words. But... I don't know. Like, it's hard for me to trust anyone mm-hmm. because yeah. I've just been the conspiracy theorist tinfoil hat for 20 years. So anybody yes. who makes it out in front and starts these movements that are very popular, um, I'm automatically skeptical of them. I'm not saying they're evil people or doing nefarious no. things. I'm just saying, this is weird. <laughs> um, warning, warning. Like, warning. you know, my spidey senses are tingling when, you know, people are converting to Catholicism, even though they've been talking about, you know, different uh, orthodoxy uh, for a long time and because obviously the catholic church is fully on board with all of yes. this um, amalgamation of religions the pope is yes we are doing this i'm kissing yes. the feet of you know women and islam and whatever he's got pachamama on his robes and just yeah. a clown mass so and all of this stuff is coming from weird tibetan voices okay yeah. blavatsky she claimed that she would come downstairs and pages um, of her books would just be written, like typewritten for her when she woke up. Okay. Yeah. So this she sounds like channeling. Yeah. So maybe she was automatic channeling. Um, I don't know. It could have been other people doing manuscripts for her. Who knows? Because uh, the the con is wrapped up in the demonism, so it's hard to pull those two things apart, right? Yeah. I think it's really hard. Well, the reason I brought up the arc is just because they're doing it very much under the umbrella of it being Christian. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it is a, a dialectical arm because, you know, they've they've been very successful from, you know, that, I don't know how else to word it, but people who identify on the left, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think it's a false construct, but people who identify and associate that way have been very successful at creating subversion. But now they're appealing to, you know, the the other side who is a more religious kind of uh um i mean they might align more conservative more on the quote unquote right and they're using that umbrella and i think it's just it's a way to lure people in because when you actually listen to what they're saying it's very mystical mm-hmm. um and then i mean I, this is a whole tangent but i mean i can show you the funding arm is they claim to be counteracting and combating the world economic forum but their funding comes directly from people whose clients are the world economic forum so that's a little questionable but you know that's the thing about these people there's backup plans to backup plans to backup plans <laughs> and um they just kind of like throw money at all these things and hope one of them sticks and sticks. sometimes people don't even know who they're working for no, and, and that's what, uh, like you said, you don't necessarily, you know, you know, pin him as necessarily the bad guy. Sometimes people don't know, yeah. but the 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 money trail when you follow it, it's like okay, so you're you're somehow going to compact the World Economic Forum, but mm-hmm. meanwhile, the people who are funding you are their their number one client is the World Economic Forum. Uh, so it's very questionable. Yeah, but and uh, speaking of money and Tibet, um, I want to remind you guys that Great Seal on the dollar bill, the one with the pyramid that everybody's like Illuminati, that comes yeah. straight from Tibet, also from Nicholas yes. Rorick and telling the vice president that this is what we're going to have as our magical sigil for our one dollar, and that's why the dollar bill has never changed from then to now, is because that's their spell, and mm-hmm. so. Alice Bailey, she worked for this Tibetan guy, right? The voice for 27 years. And what they're saying is the hierarchy that has always been all cool, but she called him DK. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, The hierarchy was taking steps to come closer to humanity, to restore the ancient mysteries of Babylon and Egypt. Yeah. And so Bailey's teachings became the complete spiritual foundation of the United Nations. Um, Blavatsky and Bailey both were avid trance channelers. 
Mm -hmm. And they had these predictions of the Lord Maitreya or the new Christ, the Antichrist, yes. instead of Christ, um, yes. who they called Atreyu. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Atre Atreyu? Yeah. Oh, maybe I'm thinking of something else. No. Uh, remember that movie, Never Ending Story? Oh, interesting. And the little boys call Atreyu? Yeah. And at the yeah. end um she says you have to give me a new name or i'm gonna die that remember at the climax where he has mm -hmm. to yell out her name in the storm and do you remember what he yells out as her new name no moon child wow yeah wow i've never put that together interesting so the never ending story is this like kind of theosophical gnostic it is fantastical um allegory right right yeah and wow. it, because people are like this is weird you know when you watch something as an adult you're like these things are creepy and disgusting and like the snail man and the rock eater and the wolf and like i wouldn't i don't know if i'd let my kid watch that it's pretty creepy yeah i i haven't watched never ending story i mean in a really long time i don't really remember it so it'd and be really interesting to watch it now the symbol on the book is like two snakes doing an infinity Ouroboros. Remember that? No. Yeah. Now I'm going to have to go look at the never ending story. <laughs> That's crazy. Also, um, Wizard of Oz is a theosophical fairy tale. Yes. That, that I do know. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, you've got these predictions of, you know, they tried to make Krishnamurti into this thing, but he, like you said, uh, he didn't want to, it turned out to be a nothing burger. It didn't work out. Yes. Um, and then you've got the Lucius Trust, the fulfillment of the divine plan. Um, and you have World of Goodwill. They use their... Um, That's the other one, yeah. Yeah. Their main um, focus is meditation and how to get the world to meditate. Because this is the way that everybody is going to be linked up to the world um, religion is by meditation. Yep. Yeah, this is part of why, uh, like I was saying about things like ayahuasca and the psychedelics, mm -hmm. because this is a, it puts people into a trance, like a meditative like state. And so then they can, you know, channel or, you know, yeah, hypnotize and, them or whatever. Like Terrence McKenna and take the mushrooms and the mushrooms tell you there's too many white people. And, you know, all of these crazy things that they're trying to um, bring about. So the... The meditation they actually have you know what they call the meditation room yeah with the black magnetic box and it has all of the 666 uh numerology um yeah i it's a uh, it's it's i don't know how to say it's a black cube essentially but it's a yeah. magnetic box i don't remember the exact uh dimensions but it it had a lot of 666 reference yeah it's from Sweden. We talked about that, I think, in the the Beyonce sh live stream that I did. Either Taylor Swift or Beyonce were talking about the UN meditation room. But let me um, read this real quick, and then we'll we'll go back to that. So they think that um, they have a deeper understanding of a sacrifice made by Lucifer. So it, it wasn't Christ that gave the sacrifices. Actually, Lucifer sacrificed himself by becoming a fallen angel to bring enlightenment to humanity and they view lucifer as one of the solar angels those mm -hmm. advanced beings who theosophy says descended um through the fall from venus to our planet eons ago to bring the principle of mind to what was then the animal man so they have some really weird um ideas about evolution i'm gonna get to that in a second um in the theosophical perspective the descent of the solar angels was not a fall into sin but rather an act of great sacrifice as is suggested in the name Lucifer, which means light bearer. So Lucifer gave the ultimate sacrifice for our uh, spiritual development as a species. And like I said, a large portion of their philosophy relies on meditation. They have a monthly moon meditation meeting and mm -hmm. they're scheduled under the corresponding zodiacs for that particular month during the full moon. I think I have... A chart of that right here i mean it's just a calendar of their here it is the 12 spiritual festivals of the un right there uh, you, you probably can't read that but it, you know no. the schedule right from the un 
Um, we're doing moon meditation in Sagittarius. Yes. From the UN. Yeah, yeah. So the meditation room is the creepiest shit you've ever seen. Um, I don't know if there's a picture. Oh, okay. Here's a picture of it. Okay. We talked about this uh, in an article I did um, called The Goddess and the Baby Eater, but there's a picture of that cube. Yes. The cube, right. the black cube. Black and cube. It, it, they do say it's magnetic. Yeah. Uh huh. So it's like a black stone altar and it looks a lot like the Kaaba stone. Um, they say that the goddess Diana was worshipped in the form of a stone that fell from heaven. And they even talk about this in the Bible in Acts 19. And if you know anything about Islam and about the Kaaba stone it is the black cube. But in the cornerstone of the black cube is some kind of space rock in like a space vagina. Right. That's the yeah. only way yeah, I can describe it. it OK. Yeah. <laughs> Space Pussy has this rock inside it, and that's their, <laughs> like, most sacred relic. And this goes back to um, the worship of Diana or, um, you know, the goddess. Mm -hmm. uh, what was I going to say about that? Well, this is uh, maybe while you're thinking of it, I'll just share huh. that this is so important because uh, this is the religion they're talking about, the, the Gaia religion, the Mother Earth. That's why and I need a moon on the flag of Islam, a moon and yes. a pentagram. Because for the yeah, God, right. That's right. Yeah, and they they're talking about this in all these. That that's what they're using to usher in this whole like climate religion. You mm -hmm. know, they're they're talking about how we have to save the planet, and it's it's really it's the religion of Gaia. It's that that the and the the Theosophists talk about this too. And this uh, it does go. You know, Blavatsky talks about it, but it does go way back. That you know, the Neoplatonists talked about it as well how the instead of earth being a divine creation of the creator they say that it is the god nature is the god mm -hmm. and when you hear all of these people at the un the world economic forum uh, all of these different cults because they're not the only ones there's these uh, uh, you you hear oprah you hear these groups it, there's this group called like the world evolutionary leaders like deepak chopra's in it and like uh uh, what a uh, Barbara Max Hubbard and uh, they, they, they they talk about the evolution of humanity to this you know this collective consciousness and uh, they talk about how nature is God so yeah well, this, they this also the believe nature. yes nature is God and that is pan and so when we were doing hidden mm -hmm. dangers of the rainbow we were talking about um Fenthorn Findhorn I don't know how you pronounce. Some people say find horn. horn. Some say find yeah. horn. Yeah. Oh, that, but find horn. It's F I N D E horn. Yes. Yeah. So these people literally think that the vegetables were talking to them. Yes. Like cabbages told them that the God is nature and all. And they met with Pan in the forest. And then they like make up these religions that become recognized by the UN, like from literally from talking vegetables. And so the black stone in the meditation room is uh, dedicated to the unknown God or the God of all. Mm -hmm. God and of then all. that creepy mural has 72 geometric figures, which correspond to the 72 names of God in the Kabbalah. This, yeah, this is super interesting to me. I, that thing right I've there. just started to look into Kabbalah. I, I actually don't know a whole lot about it, but it seems that there are different iterations of Kabbalah mm -hmm. and the Lurianic Kabbalah was in the 1600s, completely kind of like mystified the original Kabbalah. Do you, are you, you might be more yes, familiar with they have, It's like the Freemasons, you know, their, their lore, they can kind of like attribute it back to the beginning of time or like the, uh -huh. uh, uh the fall of the Tower of Babel or the building of Solomon's right. Temple or the Knights Templar or the this yeah. or that. So they're always trying to um, link their uh, practices back to the ancients, which they can, um, yeah. but it doesn't come through perfectly preserved. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No, well, it looks yeah. like it, they totally mystified it. It doesn't look like it's the original at all, actually. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So yeah, the Kabbalah as we know it, that that's more of like a Spanish, like you said, like I feel like in the 1500s is when this all started in in. Um... Okay, I know Lurianic was in the middle 1600s. Okay, Lurianic, yeah. 
So yeah, it's Jewish mysticism. Yeah. Um, it's magic that they say started uh, with King Solomon mm -hmm. and uh, his ability to control the spirits of nature with magic words and magic rings and with the help right. of his pagan wives building all different um, shrines to different gods and goddesses. Mm -hmm. right? right. Yeah. So yeah, there's link to Kabbalah right there. And then the room itself, the meditation room is 33 feet long. So that's a Freemasonic number. Yes. And uh, in the shape of a trapezoid. So if you study um, geography, ge geometry, geometry in occultism, you're going to learn that the trapezoid is something called a frustrum. So this room is in the shape of a trapezoid and the truncated pyramid, pyramid with the point cut off, that mm -hmm. is the trapezoid, right? Because yeah. it, it doesn't make a point to God and it's cut off from God. So that is the symbolism of that. And that's why uh, Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan, even made a special appendant body called the Order of the Trapezoid because he it is uh, it attracts evil, basically. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's very creepy. <laughs> that's not the only <laughs> creepy thing. So we're going to talk about the mural in a second, the, the other mural in the other room. But the, so the UN is a reversal of the Tower of Babel to the one world religion of Babylon. So back then the languages were uh, separated and the people had all yeah. had to go their own way. This is the great coming back together of yeah. that working. Um, and then you hear things like love and lie and all of these mm. buzzwords, right? Yes. These are straight from the UN and uh yeah when you go on the lucius trust website you see i mean they have the the pyramid and then the, the the word light and you see a big light emanating um and they talk and this is it is the, the not to lucifer the, as you said the light bearer uh -huh. um they they talk about blavatsky talks about this too how uh it was because uh you know it was really the reason Luc lucifer really is the god is because that god trapped them so this is again a very gnostic view you know that but lucifer was really trying to help man yeah uh, in the garden and uh, so therefore he's really the god and it's this idea that through logic and reason and intellect you know gnosis essentially the greek word for gnosis um that we can not only have access to the esoteric wisdom but through that they essentially they essentially believe they can become gods exactly it's the perfectibility of man yeah. And so, yes, they can become these ascended masters yeah. and go up and float in the Himalayas with their legs crossed and, you know, meditate in the mountains. Yes. <laughs> but they, yeah. they have three goals for humanity. Um, one yes. is the reorganization of the world religions um, because they think they are out of date. Number two is the mm -hmm. gradual dissolution um, of the Orthodox Jewish faith. So this is weird. Because you see these um, wars getting fomented. And this yeah. is why, in part, we have the conflicts that are going on as we speak in Israel and Palestine. Because the UN and Great Britain promised that land to two different people. Yes, they right? did. <laughs> and they, they, they promised both sides the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's like conflict. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, they... Because they think that, um, and this led to the ideas that uh, became the Holocaust also, they think that the Jewish people have some kind of um, soul debt that they have to pay. Yeah. And so therefore they deserve to be um, oppressed and exterminated because they are not one of the good root races. Right. Right? Right. So then, yeah, that's their second goal. Um, their third goal is the preparation for revelation. And this is the revelation of, like, probably AI. I think it is AI. I think that's what they're using anyway. But it's hard to, you know, this is where it gets a little bit tricky because it's hard to extrapolate, again, the con from the belief mm -hmm. uh, and the, the actuality because... I, I think in some ways the, the theosophy is a tool. It's a tool for them to 
to get everybody under this one umbrella, but also to convince people that it's for the better good of humanity, because really it's, you know, we're not, well, we love everyone, all is light, all is love, and there are no differences between us. And you hear them say this over and over again. They're, you know, we're all the same. We're way more alike than we are different. And you hear this at all of these different, whether it be the UN, the World Parliament of Religions, they, they talk about this. It's so interesting. You hear how we're all so similar. Mm -hmm. And so, they, you know, and so we need to you know, dissolve all the boundaries. And they keep saying this over and over again, dissolution of boundaries. So it's hard to say whether or not, but AI does do that, right? So it's hard to say whether or not it's really using this one world religion as the tool, as the conduit to be able to usher in their enslavement mechanism, which is this AI prison. And it's a prison. I mean, they, they lay it out very clearly. Mm -hmm. It really is a prison and they call human beings objects in this AI world society. So, well, they have some weird ideas about evolution. I have this written down somewhere, but if I come back to it, but they think that people evolve from like mineral to animal to, mm -hmm. right? Yes, they do. And this is part of their re reincarnation. Yeah. This is, so depending on how, and a lot of this again is through gnosis, because they believe if you were able, you know, you had enough, uh, they, Blavatsky talks about uh, Jacob Bohem and, and it like praises him how he was this, uh, you know, basically he was an apprentice to a shoemaker and, you know, he didn't have a lot of formal education, but because he was able to channel the ascendant master, he, he was so, he got it a little bit wrong, she said, because in the end he, uh, actually subscribed more to Christianity. He was a little bit too uh, beholden to the Christian tenets. And so he got it wrong, but he, because he was such a great mystic, I'm paraphrasing, I could find, I could pull out the actual quote, but he says, because he was such a great mystic and uh, because, you know, he, he channeled and uh, that, you know, therefore he was, uh, you know, he was to be lauded and praised. And, and this, this is, I, this is what you see repeatedly. I just see this throughout that it's, they want to use this, uh, the mystification as a way of kind of pulling the wool over. So again, it's just, it's really hard to, you know, pull, separate the con from the, the, I the don't demonism. Know, the demon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's a good quote here. Um, author of a new world religion, William Jasper describes mm -hmm. the UN and he says it's a weird and diabolical convergence of new age mysticism, pantheism, mm -hmm. aboriginal animism, atheism, mm -hmm. communism, socialism, luciferian occultism, apostate Christianity, Islam, mm -hmm. Taoism, Buddhism, Hinduism, a strange admixture of crystal worshipers, astrologers, mm -hmm. feminists, mm -hmm. environmentalists, Kabbalists, human potentialists. Eastern mystics, yes. pop psychologists, and liberal clergymen, one would normally associate with the offbeat sandals and beads counterculture of the 1960s. But today's worshipers in this rapidly expanding movement are as likely to be scientists, diplomats, corporate presidents, heads of state, international bankers, and leaders of mainstream Christian churches. Yes, well, that's so true. Where, where is that from? This is from... William Jasper, author of A New World Religion, describes okay. the UN. Yeah, no, that that's exactly what I see over and over again. And they're using it to, you know, it reminds me of the whole uh, creation of the field of social science. They they try to legitimize it through, uh, you know, methodology, mm -hmm. but essentially it's all, it's all the same. It all goes back to, you know, mystical occultism. And then they try to graft in a like pop uh, psychology and pop philosophy, like, um, you know, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, or mm -hmm. uh, what else am I thinking of? Deepak Chopra. Well, Deepak Chopra is one of these uh, world evolutionary leaders. Yeah. And they think that they're going to evolve humanity. So in this uh, world parliament of religions, uh, one of the one of the leaders I was talking about was a uh, Robert Mueller, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he talks about this a lot, how, uh, you know, he's so uh, inspired because he's seeing that humanity really is evolving and uh, that, you know, we're, we're just not there yet, but we're evolving. We're evolving because uh, they, 
because more people are I, he doesn't use these words, but essentially because they're subscribing to these these philosophical principles, and so the people who are enlightened are 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 evolving to the next stage of humanity, and it's part of this humanity that's going to be all one. Yeah. So from the theosophical perspective, some of the humans have evolved and ascended to godhood, and. Yeah. In the future, that's what I'm talking about. You are either going to evolve and be spiritual, not religious, right? Um, or you're going to be recycled. And then they think that, you know, they can progress through the four lower kingdoms, what they call it, the mineral, the vegetable, the animal, and the human, and become some kind of master. So it says occult beliefs in evolution are different than Darwin's theory. The mystery school teach man evolve from mineral um, all the way to human. Uh, mystery teaching believes Adam and Eve were in the animal state when the serpent set them free with knowledge that evolved them into humans. Now, this also reminds me of 2001 Space Odyssey. Okay. Where the monolith comes down to the ape men, and that uh, is a um, allegory for the next quantum leap in evolution uh, technology mm -hmm. is the monolith or the television or the movie screen, right. rather. Um, <clears throat> and this is what's injected into uh, humanity to force a, another step in the evolution. Mm -hmm. Right? Well, that's what they're saying, human 2.0, right? Yeah. And that's uh, the, the transhumanism, the human exactly. 2.0. Yes, transhumanism and the, what's it called? The singularity. The singularity, which yeah. the AI world society is literally creating the singularity. Mm -hmm. Literally creating the singularity. Yeah. Um, so this hierarchy that they talk about, mm -hmm. um, just a fancy name for probably hierarchy of demons, right? And no way. <laughs> what? It seems that way, yeah. <laughs> and they're, you know, they're the masters of wisdom. They're the the fancy mm -hmm. lords. Um, they're the, called the lords of liberation who reached the advanced spiritual thinking, um, and their minds are rightly focused. And then they have uh something called the rider on the white horse from the secret place, reached by those whose hearts are rightly touched. And these are the things that you get in touch with when you're meditating. And then they have something mm. called the Lord of Civilization or Master R, who mm. you can contact um, <clears throat> and stand with masked intent. Uh, and so these beings also, Tiny Mustache Man and uh, other occultists report having contact with them. And mm -hmm. they say when they come, the... Uh, I was bleeding out of my nose and my ears and I felt like I was going to puke and, you know, it's not good. Right. But yet they keep summoning them. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> um, there's So the Theosophical Society is still in uh, operation today. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, they have uh, their, the Theosophical Society in America, they, they say that they have their, they have a vision, they have a mission. And they have an ethic. Their vision is of wholeness. It inspires a fellowship of united in study, meditation, and service. This is what you're talking about with the med meditation. Mm -hmm. They have a mission of encouraging open-minded inquiry into world religion, philosophy, science, and the arts in order to understand the wisdom of ages, respect the unity of all life, and help people explore spiritual self-transformation. Um, this goes back again all the way to the ancient mysteries when they where they be, they believed i'll just read this because they believed that the deity was an absolute principle principle transcendent indescribable and incomprehensible so they believe that if the soul is immortal and of divine origin then theurgy the divine work would be the art of total total self-transformation and transvaluation of all experience mm -hmm. and so therefore transform human nation sorry human nature through light uh, the sacred light that it reveals. And this is, you know, the, the, the light of Lucifer, exactly. which is the, the light that they show you when they take off your blindfold at the end of the third degree of masonry. And you, you've been um, resurrected by the grip of the lion's paw. And now you're looking at the blazing star, the pentagram, and you're, you've seen the light. 
Yes. So this is the light of Lucifer. And yeah, they're talking about bringing about what they call the kingdom of God. Um, but they think this the, is the appearance of soul controlled men on earth. And then the spiritual hierarchy can be um, deduced and the normality of existence emphasized. And the people with good sense will testify to the fact that the presence of those who have achieved this goal. So it's just probably the computer will decide who. Well, they say that in the AI world society, they say that the computer is going to make the all the decisions because we won't have any uh, governing bodies of humans. So it's all right. going to be determined by AI. And they say that they've, they've laid it out. So the name of the book is remaking the world, the age of global enlightenment. <laughs> so <laughs> that that's actually the blueprint that they're using. That's the name of the white paper that Michael Dukakis wrote mm -hmm. uh, you know, for governor of Massachusetts. It's done with, in conjunction with Boston global forum. You can, anybody can download it. They you just have to give up an email, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I feel like just the name alone, if that's not an, a nod to the new age and a theosophical movement, right? It's the age of global enlightenment. That's what they're ushering in with their AI world society. Right. So, and yeah. so they say that these certain spiritual masters, they are born, live and die among us. And they change the world through their teachings, which you can access through meditation. And then starting this all like kicked off, according to them, um, <clears throat> heavily in 1860 like we were talking about right before the civil mm -hmm. war mm -hmm. and then the return they say the time has come for the return into recognized physical expression of the christ leading to the definite restoration of the mysteries this that certain of the senior members of the hierarchy will appear and take outer and recognizable physical control of world affairs that sounds really ominous and creepy yes it does that sounds right? scary it so sounds thank like what, what we're seeing. I mean, that's what we're seeing. We, yeah. We're seeing we completely take full control. Um, and they're doing it under the guise that this is this good for us because they're enlightening us and they're doing it for the betterment of man. Yes. And I don't think the Blavatsky and them could have envisioned the kind of technocracy that we have. No. Um, but that, that's what led up to it. It says they will appear in office of some kind or another they will be the current politicians, businessmen, financiers, religious teachers, or churchmen. They will be scientists and philosophers, college professors, and educators. They will be the mayors of cities and the custodians of all the public ethical movements. So you think these things just spring up organically, right? Do you think Rosa Parks just decided, like, I'm going to, you know, sit up front in the bus that day and, like, start civil? No, that thing was a no. stunt right? Yeah. They had to no. go back the next day because they didn't get it right the first day. And so that they have yep. the people there and the, the media and everything, everything is a freaking con and a stunt, you guys. It, it is. So their ethic, and this, this applies to that, they're at, they have an ethic of holding that every action, feeling, and thought, an effect of all other beings, and that each of us is capable and responsible for contributing to the benefit of the whole. That's one of their primary ethics. So, of course, they would create stunts that are because they believe it's all part of uh, the machine, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's God is everything, so you can't create or destroy matter or whatever. It doesn't matter really what you do. Right? Yeah. So there, there was a quote about that too, about um how the, and this this is where some of them do differentiate a bit about where uh, the descending into matter versus uh what matter is mm -hmm. um so of course you know humans are uh the part of the human journey is that we become we descend we fall into matter but that that that's the theosophical journey is to return to the one mm -hmm. so Blavatsky said that you know that doesn't it's not necessarily a bad thing but it's part that's part of our journey but some of the other theosophists said that you know that's a uh, that's our uh that's our fall because we're part of matter yeah, exactly. You you were talking about the Neoplatonists. And so, yeah, the return to the monad is um, mm -hmm. their goal, right? right? So there there will be a new type of political guidance. There's going to be a new religion. Um, Orthodox Judaism will disappear, according to them. The mm -hmm. Buddhism will spread. Uh, Christianity will be in upheaval. And then comes the restoration of the mysteries. 
And this falls into three phases that correspond generally to the three degrees of masonry. Um, so we've got number one, the stage of general recognition of light in all departments of human being. There's your love and light, man. It's just all love and light, man. Right? Yeah. And then um, number two is the stage of complete economic reorientation. So this is going on right now with the Great Reset and the World Economic Forum and digital currency and mm -hmm. the valuation of all currencies because they want that all to be in control of AI. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And then um, the third stage is the reward of light received and the reward of service rendered spiritual status is recognized through the medium of what is regarded as major initiation so there's going to be an event that causes everybody to become initiated in the new world to be a new world citizen they've been talking about this in sci-fi forever yes. um i'm thinking of what's that one with the bugs the high the uh ants the no okay. that goofy sci-fi movie um with they go off world to kill bugs anyways okay um the audience will know what i'm talking about uh okay but in the beginning they're like are you a global citizen and yeah. it's a commercial and it's like you have to join the um army to go fight the bugs on other planets to get okay. your global citizenship well, they, I mean, that's in all of the literature. They talk about the global citizens. And uh, when you uh, look at the, uh, when we were talking about like UNESCO and the education, they talk about that back then too. This is like, you know, like very much in the 80s, but even, even they use different terminology, even all the way back in the early 1900s and the 1800s. And they talk about how they need to train um, you know, later they say they want to put every child into the computer, but mm -hmm. essentially it's that they are figuring out their data mining so that they can train children so that they can be part of the, uh, like world organization. And it essentially it's like a world corporation, right? And so they need to figure out how to like the way the military does, right? They, they test you and then they train you for how you're going to operate in the machine. And they they were they were very explicit in their documents about education that they were going to do this for children. Well, but the, the citizenship literature is like I mean that's in everything now. Yeah. Starship Troopers was the movie that I was thinking. Okay, so that's a classic sci-fi. Um, and then what you just described sounds a lot like Ender's Game. Have you heard of that one? Okay, I don't know. So Ender's Game is about my movies. training. Well, it was an old sci-fi book. Um. Okay training children uh, to fight in the military via video games. And they take the uh, most talented children that score the highest in the video games, and then they uh, are the ones who um, control the, the weapons in the remote war. And the end wow. of the book, uh, you think that the kids are just playing video games, but you come to find out they were actually fighting a real war and they didn't know that they were... Um, actually killing people they thought they were playing a video game wow yeah well i feel like that's very uh you know that's total predictive programming yes um because for the ai world society and when you talk about how they're going to initiate people i mean that's i i, I that's exactly what i see they're they're figuring out all of these different ways you have to opt in to everything but i think that the religion this theosophical religion is a way that they can lure people because it's under the guise that they're tolerant, they're accepting, you know, and that you can keep your religion, even though that's really not true, because it's going to be a dissolution of all religions. It's good. So they blur it and they, you know, they mystify it so that you lose all the essence of what your religion actually is. And I'll read the quote from Blavatsky, because she specifically says it is antithetical to Christianity. And she says, the Christian reader is no doubt aware that theosophy is not a religion, but a philosophy, which is both religious and scientific, and that the chief work so far of the Theosophical Society has been to revive each religion in its own animating spirit by encouraging and helping inquiry into the true significance of each of its doctrines and observances. Theosophists know that a deeper one penetrates into the meaning of the dogma and ceremonies of all religion. The greater becomes the apparent underlying similarity until finally a perception of the fundamental unity is reached 
is common ground in no other than theosophy, the secret doctrine of the ages, deluded, distinguished to suit capacity of the multitude and the requirements of the time, has formed a living kernel of all religions. Um, and then she talks about the Theosoph Theosophical Society as branches, respectively composed of Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, Zoroastrians, Christians, free thinkers, who work together as brethren on the common ground of theosophy. And it is precisely because theosophy is not a religion, nor can it uh, for the multitude supply the place of a religion. The success of its teaching has been so great, not merely as regards to its growing membership and extending influence, but also in respect to the cultivation of the sentiment of compassion, wisdom among human beings on the globe. Uh, we theosophists believe that religion is a natural in incident of man's life in his present stage of development, and that although in rare cases individuals may be born without religious sentiment, the community must have religion. So they understand that this is part of why I think, you know, they use it as a tool because they, they say like the future is religious and it, that human beings are intrinsically religious. Mm -hmm. um, they can use that to guide people towards their religion and their goals uh, under the penalty of social decay and material that is to say it's a uniting bond under the penalty of social decay and material annihilation. We believe that no religious doctrine can be more than an attempt to picture our present limited understandings in the terms of our terrestrial experiences, great, uh, and the spiritual truths, um, our normal state of consciousness we vaguely sense rather than actually perceive and comprehend and a revelation. If it's revealing anything, we must necessarily conform to the same earthbound requirements of the human intellect. So then again, it's this idea that it's a only the fire, fire in the minds of men. Yes, yeah. that's, that's exactly what it is. Um, and then I'll see if I can get to the end of it where she says, this is this is where she says, so far as Christian doctrines, we'll skip ahead. Um, it's just so far as the Christian doctrine goes contrary to those ethics. Um, well, right before that, she said, uh, so far, a modern Christianity makes it claim to be the practical religion taught by Jesus. The theosophists are with heart and hand, but the historical truth about the gospels is another issue. So far as the Christian doctrine goes contrary to these ethics, pure and simple, the theosophists are its opponents. Any Christian can, if you will, compare the Sermon on the Mount and the gospels with the dogmas of his church the spirit that he breathes it in with the principles that animate Christian civilization govern his own life. And he will be able to judge for himself how far the religion of Jesus enters into Christianity and how far therefore he and the theosophists are agreed, but professing Christians, especially the clergy shrink from making this comparison like merchants who fear to find themselves bankrupt. They seem to dread discovery of discrepancy in their accountants, which could not be made good by placing material assets as a set off to spiritual liabilities. The comparisons between teachings of Jesus and the doctrines of the churches has, however, frequently been made, and often with great learning and critical acumen. Both of these would abolish Christianity, and those who would reform it, and the aggregate result of the comparison goes to prove that in almost every point of the doctrines of the churches and the practices, Christians are in direct opposite to the teaching of jesus because they think jesus is the ascendant master mm -hmm. um and so yeah where i'm if without reading this entire thing but she makes the the point that it was uh she's I, the, she ends it with saying that christianity has no esoteric foundation known to those who profess it you know and this is why it's directly opposed to theosophy mm -hmm. but yeah yeah so yeah to them Religion is then recognized as an attitude governing all phases of human experience. It's not mm -hmm. what we know of it now. And then their, their first great initiation will be objectively staged and the general public will recognize it as the major rite and ritual of the new religious institution of the period. And like you were talking about, they need to destroy Christianity, the the traditional Christianity. Yep. And they're talking about the method um, that they're going to use to do this is the infiltration of false teachers. Now, Jay just did a super um, funny stream yesterday about okay. all of the like clown church 
circus converts um, that are making Christianity look ridiculous. Uh huh. Um, and I recommend you guys go watch that. It was really good. Uh, covering all of the hot button topics that have been going on Twitter this mm. week. So okay, um, yeah, it was really good. But yeah, I have to check that out. Make the church as goofy as possible. And we were talking about this today. You know, not a lot of Christians are aware that we have sacraments that are holy, and that's why you have to have a gimmick at your church every week because to keep people coming back, you know, you got to punt the Bible on Super Bowl Sunday, or you got to wear a pink sweater on Easter, or you have to like fly down with angel wings on and fog machines and light laser shows and rock concerts and stuff, because you don't have the essence of the sacraments of what's holy and what keeps you going to church. So yes, all of these false teachers, and I'm including just crazy you know tv evangelists is one of those remember mm-hmm. those uh oh yeah proud uh what's the other guy jim baker tammy faye baker uh billy graham and now like really, that's who comes to my mind <laughs> now you're gonna go lost right yes yes mega church yes. is part of that um and now you're gonna go to um you know ex only fans preacher church oh yes Totally. Right. Oh, wait. Let I'm, me read this because this okay. is exactly okay. The road to theosophy lies for you through your own religion. So this is again where they're you become your own God, right? But Jesus is my boyfriend. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we're yeah, we're accustomed to say the Buddhist, the Mohammedan, the Hindu, or the or the Pharisee. The road to theosophy lies for you through your own religion. We say this because those creeds possess deeply philosophical and esoteric meaning explanatory of the allegories under which they are presented to people but we cannot say the same thing to christian the successor of the apostles never recorded the secret doctrines of jesus the the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven which it is given to them his apostles alone know these have been suppressed made away with or destroyed what we have come down upon the stream of time the maxims, the parables, the allegories, the fables, which Jesus expressly intended for the spiritually deaf and blind, that again, to, to believe that it's only, you know, reserved for a, a few um, of these who have been enlightened, it looks like, by Lucifer, really, mm-hmm. uh, to be revealed later to the world, and which modern Christianity either takes all literally or interprets according to the fancies of the fathers of the secular church. In both cases, they are like cut flowers. They are severed from the plant on which they grew and from which and from the root whence the plant draws draws its life. We were therefore to encourage Christians, as we do votaries of other creeds, to study their own religion for themselves. Consequence would be not 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 a knowledge of the meaning of its mysteries, but either the revival of a medieval superstition and intolerance accompanied by a formidable outbreak of lip prayer and preaching or else great increase of skepticism for Christianity has no esoteric foundation known to those who profess it. Mm -hmm. And so these goofy false preachers have two uh, uses, one to deceive well-meaning people who have faith Mm -hmm. and two to turn um, people with some kind of like uh, skeptical, rational thinking, like obviously these are con men. So right. if that's what Christianity is, I don't want to be a part of that. Right. Right. So, of course, <laughs> of course. Yeah. yeah. Dual prong attack. So they, they speak of this um, alchemical process. They are yeah. talking about a final act of destruction, which will take place when the hierarchy will be fused with humanity and only shambhala will remain so let me read this uh, little quote about the alchemical process because if you don't take part in this initiation you're going to be gently recycled (laughs) so just wait it's interesting to note that the work of destruction initiated by the hierarchy during the past 175 years um they're putting that uh year 1775 and that's really close to 1776 the year of the illuminati and the year of uh united states yep 1775 has in its seeds 
as yet a very long way from germination of the final act of destruction, which will take place when the hierarchy will be completely fused and blended with humanity. This sounds like uh, singularity stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the hierarchical form will no longer be required when this happens. The three major centers will then become two and the hierarchy will disappear and only Shambhala and humanity will remain. Um, the causal body, the soul body disappears and only the monad and its expression, a fusion of soul and form are left. So it's like super kooky, uh, deep hop. Depopulation stuff. Are you with us? Are you fused to, um, are you one with us in Shambhala or are you, um, you know, getting thrown in the pot? Yes. Right. And then out of this comes uh, Agenda 21 or which is now Agenda 30. Yes. And if you don't know what those things are, then where have you been? Can you, uh, Remind us, Courtney, I'm sure you know exactly what's going on with Agenda 30. Uh, yes, Agenda 2030, and uh, now they're talking about uh, 2045 and 2050. You know why? Because oh. I think we're making a difference. I think they keep think having so to put push it back because smart people are getting on here and being like, I know what you're up to. I, I I think so. I really do think so. I You know, I, I keep saying the best laid plans of mice and men. <laughs> yeah. Um, they lay out the plans and uh, therefore it's incumbent upon us to take them seriously and uh, to inform everybody so that hopefully we can derail them and then they just uh, remain plans and they don't get, they don't come to fruition. Uh, but yeah, agenda 2030. So they, they're talking about all sorts of things like uh, they're, they're doing a 30 by 30 kind of a uh, plan. This is actually, so the Biden administration renamed it to America the beautiful because that sounds a lot better. This is what they do. They rename <laughs> things you know they have, they have a really good marketing team they have to uh, pivot I, their marketing strategies yeah I, I i keep joking i want the un's marketing team um <laughs> but they're 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 really good at it they keep rebranding and renaming things so they're they have a it's a 30 by 30 land grab that they're trying to do where they they have a plan where by 2030 only 30 percent of the our earth waters and land uh they, they want to reserve where it cannot be inhabited or used by humans. And uh, this is a stepping stone to what they call the half earth agenda. And uh, that's just what it sounds like. It was written a book written by E.O. Wilson, who is a biologist. And he talks about how half of the earth needs to be preserved. And of course, they're not going to stop there. They want to terraform the entire earth. Um, they, they've talked about this terraforming it to be like Mars and uh, they, I think this is so they can build their their AI world society there. And they use these, uh, you know, the the climate religion, because that's what it is. It's essentially a religion mm -hmm. uh, in order to convince people that they need to buy into these plans where they need to preserve the earth. And this goes back again to this uh, Gaia religion, the Mother Earth that, that they worship. And uh, yeah, so they, they, it's all tied into all of these, but they're. Um, they've already done an example of this is like Tuvalu. Um, so there was this island that they uh, they they said that they were all going to drown. You know, it's all the elites buy all this beachfront property, but somehow the beachfront property is all going to be swallowed because you know we're in a climate crisis. And mm -hmm. uh, but anyhow, they buy these properties and uh, they convinced a whole island of people that they were going to drown, and they exported them to Australia, and then they. Yeah, and they told them that they could only visit their their loved ones and you know see their their home uh, ever again through this virtual world. Yeah. Oh wow. So yeah, so I th I think that's kind of like a beta test for this AI world society. What's the name but of the island again? Tuvalu. Tuvalu. Tuvalu with a T. Oh, Tuvalu. Tu I think T U. Tuvalu. Tuvalu. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, but the Agenda 2030, I mean, they 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 have pushed, the, but a lot of it is about land grabs, and it mm -hmm. is about, uh, you know, they're, they want to, where we, we can only inhabit parts, and there'll be, like, no crossing zones, um, so they, there's a whole map of it, like, where humans can inhabit a certain portion of it, and then other parts are, like, for partial use, and then there's a, you know, where it's, like, restricted, and then you can only cross certain areas, mm -hmm. uh, so it's a way, and this is to put us into 
the cities. They want to push everybody into cities because they're going to make the cities smart cities. Mm-hmm. This is the, I I the, where I see everything going is really to build this. And you have to remember it's the UN that's doing this, right? So it's the UN centennial. So the the they imagine the year twenty forty five, which is the one hundred anniversary of the UN, mm-hmm. and so this is what they're envisioning is going to be by then. Hopefully, it won't be. Um, but it's to push us all into, so the, everything is done in these stages just to get us there. And they're hoping, I think by 2030, they want us already to be on these like UBIs and everything to be done under this, uh, digital currency. Um, but I think that that's not going to be all that realistic. I mean, we're in 2024 and a lot of people are pretty awake to that. So, (laughs) yeah, I think, I think we're making a difference. So um, do you remember that speech by George Bush Sr. where he talks about thousand points of light? Yes. So what he's talking about are these leaders of these occult organizations. And I think you brought this one up, one of these um, the, called the New Group of World Servers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can see that right on the Lucius Trust website. Mm-hmm. And they, they have a whole, they have a bunch of videos and they talk about the festivals that the world servers do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so these are, these are of course, you know, good training camp for the global citizens and they serve the world. They're, they're citizens of the world. So, and they, they make it very much like a, like a Woodstock festival. Yes. It's typically how they lure people in. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a big way to get young people, um, on board, uh, Especially if they are um, a little bit counterculture, a little bit non-traditional, is yes. like these festivals and these woo-woo and the uh, crystals and the psychedelics and all of that. Yes. So, do you remember um, those? The they're called the Cobden Club Papers. They were leaked by um, Maury Strong. Mm-hmm. Yep. And Maury Strong, was- leader of the Club of Rome, and yes, he was the chair yeah. of the United Nations Environmental Program. And so they were um, coming out with these key points that we're talking about of uh, Agenda 2030. Um, The first one is that all nations have quotas for reduction. Mm -hmm. Yep. All nations. This is all nations. So yeah, so Maurice uh, Strong, uh, the the Club of Rome, they they did the Limits of Growth document, and that Mm -hmm. was in 1972. Uh, Their 1992 Global Reformation document uh, they admitted that it was all propaganda and they said it was because they needed to create a common enemy because mm-hmm. nobody was going to buy that. I and mean, this is paraphrasing, but they essentially said it was like junk science. This whole climate narrative was mm-hmm. not dedicated on anything legitimate. And they said the people were not going to get on board, but that if they created a common enemy, that they could get people to rally behind it. And so they decided that the enemy of humanity was man. And therefore you are the carbon we need to reduce. Yes. And yes. they might um, make an addendum to that and have some kind of alien invasion because even Ronald Reagan says he talked about Star Wars and he yes. said nothing will unite the human race together yep. um, better than an alien invasion, right? Oh, what would be a greater uni- uniter of all of uh, planet Earth than yes. that we have a common enemy from <laughs> outer space? <laughs> unite under Will Smith and uh, he can go kick some alien butt, right? Yes. <laughs> so um, one of their second things was the um, notions of national sovereignty will be discarded. So mm-hmm. no more borders. We're seeing that bleed, uh, borders bleed from the south uh, and the north and everywhere in between. I mean, I just saw a sheriff of Florida talking today about the um, illegal crisis. And he had all of these like charts of uh, public enemies who are human TRAFF and they get uh, free vouchers to fly anywhere. Uh, yes, I, I did hear this. Yep. So they're literally TRAFF people yep. who are getting free airline tickets from the government to do these things. Yep. It's getting so crazy. Okay, so the third point. This um, is what all of the, um, you know, like those uh, treaties were about, right? Like, you know, creating uh, NATO and then they uh, tried to do the uh, uh, North uh, America Treaty that didn't mm-hmm. work. They tried. NAFTA. Tr- yeah, NAFTA, right? They're trying to do that. Um, you know, I think a lot of like the, the EU is, a you know, one of those consortium and they, mm-hmm. they want it because that's the first step. They have to get rid of all of the 
the borders of each of the countries. And have you ever seen that one of those EU artworks where it is literally like the Tower of Babel being reconstructed with the EU? I'll have to pull that up maybe. Oh, yeah. No, I haven't seen that. So, okay. Um, then they want to take possession of all the natural resources. Excuse me, like you said. Yep. Uh, including private property. So we're seeing yep. um, Vanguard and BlackRock and um, big conglomerates buy up all the single family homes in America. So you're not going to be able to own your own um, property anymore. Uh, and then well, they're they talking about this too. So uh, they're talking, the UN is talking about creating something called a world, a well-being economy. And this is a, oh, yeah, the happiness thing. Yes. <laughs> huh? It's a well-being economy. And it, this is really a neo-feudal uh, system. It's, you know, it's essentially communism. Um, but it's more than that because it, they're, they're using the uh, fascist corporate technocratic model mm -hmm. in order to execute it. But they, they tell us that, you know, yeah, <laughs> all sorts of happiness. That? The, the beatings will stop when morale improves or like you'll, right? Yeah, exactly. We're going to punish you until you're happy. <laughs> the faster we get on board with it, the, yeah, the, the happier we'll be. Yeah, yeah. so the, the, the less abuse we'll, we'll take, we'll, we'll just comply. But yeah, yeah they're, they're talking about like well-being is encompassing, you know, uh, everything essentially. And uh, so, you know, there's uh, the mental, the mental health, the, uh, you know, physical well-being and uh all of these things are, so of course they tie things like, uh, you know, racism and uh, <laughs> like, yeah, all of these things are tied into the, because it's part of the advancement of the 17 sustainable goals. Mm -hmm. And so, so they're creating something called a circular economy. And this is of course where you can't, they have to have a dissolution of private property in order to achieve this. So they, they tell us we will own nothing and be happy. But in their own texts and in their own religion, let's just call it what it is, all people are not equal. They're just using these uh, ideas and buzzwords to uh, get to their goal because they explain that not all races and people are equal. That's where we get back to the root races, the Arianism, the um, anti-Semitism. He says, not all races are equal, nor should they be. These Those races proven superior by superior achievements ought to rule the lesser races, caring for them on sufferance that they cooperate with the Security Council. Decision-making, including banking, trade, currency rates, and economic development plans will be made in stewardship by the major nations. So they do talk about, they want to preserve their... Um, <clears throat> their glorious anglo-saxon system of banking insurance and trade yes is that crazy it's crazy so not only are united nations cuckoo plastic bananas yes listening to uh tibetan weirdos voices from the ether that supposedly live in the himalayas they also think the aryan race is on top and they need to preserve their system of banking insurance and trade I think they just kind of cherry pick whatever serves them, though. Yes, that is the magician. Uh, that's what the yeah. fourth floor of the Freemason is. Like, you are a transcendent above good and evil, because if all is one and we're all random uh, mutations, then nothing matters, really. Exactly. Yes. Um, okay. Part of their ideas back then were the National Socialism, which we all know became the uh, NAZI party. And then, um, yeah, let's talk about the war on children just to, to wrap it up. And then we'll talk about the mural. I don't know if you've seen this. It's super creepy, yeah. but I have a little exegesis. Um, I can tell you, I did find the, uh, from the beginning that I was looking for the three uh, characteristics of theosophy that mm -hmm. she talked about. So okay. I think we pretty much wrapped, we, we've kind of gone through them, but just to delineate it, it's divine human nature triangle. So the inspired analysis, which circles through these angles, the intra-divine within, the origin, death, and placement of human relating to divinity and nature, nature as alive, the external, intellectual, and material. All three complex correlations synthesized via intellect and imaginative process of the mind. So this is the, uh, you know, through the uh, meditation, they're able to synthesize yes. all of these uh, correlations and 
they become one with nature and then they achieve they become the divine uh, and then there's the primacy yeah. of the mythic the creative imagination and ex external world of symbol glyphs myths synchronicities and the myriad along with the image all universal reality for the interplay of conjoined by the creative mind so this is i when, like you were saying that we're not all equal. I mean, they keep saying that it's only reserved for the initiates. Mm -hmm. It's like, <laughs> but somehow we're all equal, except that only the initiates are, you know, privy. <laughs> yeah, only the spiritual will be allowed in the utopia. It's not for everybody. Like I said, you're you're going to be um, offered back up to the earth. Yes. As a right. sacrifice. And, and, uh, right. Right. And then you can be recycled. Yes. And then access to the supreme world, the awakening within, inherently possessing the faculty to directly connect to the divine world, the existence of a spiritual, of a special, sorry, human ability to create this connection, the ability to connect and explore all levels of reality, co penetrate with the, the human with the divine, to bond all reality and experience a unique inner awakening. This is essentially just the mystic speak for mystery school philosophy. Mm -hmm. I want to become God through the intellect. But you know, this is this is crazy. So uh, you know, I was doing research on Tavistock and they they've updated their website mm -hmm. and they call themselves an awakening organization. And they say that they're they're recruiting Gnostic reticulists. Like alien reticulists? What's a reticulous? I, no, I, I think reticulous, like, you know, uh, po policymaker. Like, oh, oh, okay. Um, okay. So they're, 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 they're recruiting. I mean, these agnostic reticulous, it's your time. This is your time. <laughs> I was like, wow, that, that's pretty right out there. Yes. It's going to be a bunch of like weird feminists in yoga pants. Yes. That you ha have not reached your uh, sustainable goal of spiritualism. And you cannot come into the future with us. Yes. Right? Well, there there is a cult. It's a they they call themselves the World Evolutionary Leaders, and they seem to be penetrating everywhere. Mm -hmm. There, there's a lot of them are high up in the UN. A lot of them are, you know, political leader. They're certainly all over the entertainment sphere. Mm -hmm. you know, brought a lot of them on, and yeah. So, uh, and Paulo Coelho is one of those. Uh, he wrote the alchemist and the other that a lot of the celebrities like anyways maybe so okay let's talk about war on children um okay so we we went over the first official business of the un if you all yes. remember was to negotiate the land of israel and palestine as a home for the chosen people in 1948 and right. look how good that's going right where we started and where we are <laughs> um Ooh. not good not good. Then um, there is a, well, United Nations is actually behind all of the woke ideology through their yes. tanks. Um, they are behind all of the things like the abobos and the self abobos. Yep. And, um, most importantly, they are in on the sexualization of young children through yes. guidance for schools worldwide on sex education. Now we talk mm -hmm. crazy when you go back and you look at the literature of like uh, um, on education going way, way back. And they talk about how, uh, and it, it really, it is a religious uh, calling to be able to have to teach this sexualization to children. It's, yes. it's so incredibly creepy. It's and, um, and they've they've been talking about it for a very long time. It's not new, but they had to do it in stages. Yes. And one of these is UNESCO. So the United yep. Nations Education Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, they were behind um making sure that all of the children got all their stabbies when they should. And yep. their motto for the stabby children program was no child left behind. Yes. So, this is their motto for everything uh yeah. that can mean two things that's what you can, that oh, can yeah. mean two things sure, right sure. right um but in, in their case it's uh to cater to the lowest denominator right so this is you know, where guess of course the brainchild of julian huxley who was the uh you know uh 
famous eugenicist, but he was also the one to coin the term transhumanism in 1957. Mm -hmm. Although Max Moore is now trying to claim that title. Mm. Um, He's arguing that that he coined it. Um, But he was also uh, the founder, one of the founders of the World Wildlife Organization. Mm -hmm. They're really instrumental. They were actually uh, one of the sub uh, partners for, you know, I was uh, fighting the NACs, the natural asset companies that they were, which are coming back, but we did stop the SEC. Um, (laughs) That's that's awesome. I I don't think I single-handedly did, but, you know, people did sound the alarm and uh, enough people submitted comments. And so the SEC withdrew their proposed rule. Um, But that was the intrinsic exchange group who mm. had partnered with the New York Stock Exchange. And so just for people who aren't familiar, NACs are natural asset companies. So they were proposing a rule of, that the SEC would create a new category of companies and they would put it up on the New York Stock Exchange where you could basically publicly trade even privately owned land. Mm. And they, it was all done under the guise of conservation. And so you could have like a private conservation easement uh, and not even know that it was enrolled in uh, one of these uh, easements. And then they could put it up on this, uh, on the New York Stock Exchange and they would have uh, what they call ecosystem management rights. But anyway, the World Wildlife Organization was one of the partners in this. So they're very instrumental in advancing the Agenda 2030 goals. Of course, one of the main partners was the Rockefeller Foundation. We know what their goals are, so. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of taxpayer funded uh, (laughs) Alfred Kinsey. Yes. Okay, uh, the guy who, whose um, research yes. informed where we get our um, public school sex education literature today, uh, a guy who thought it was a good idea to put toothbrush up his wiener and hang himself from the ceiling by his balls and all sorts of other disgusting, crazy crap. This is the guy who traveled the world trying to get... Um, sentences reduced for sex offenders yep uh Didn't then, he do one of the like early like trans you know surgeries oh did he i don't I know i think he was, did do like as an experiment probably he was <laughs> a freak show man and so this yeah. is like where this is the beginning of sex ed okay yep. and um now uh you have uh, every day you have a new bonkers article like what they're giving kids at school to do send them home with dildos send them home with vibrators send them home with porn send them home like uh so he didn't condemn them but he he didn't approve of the actual surgery so uh, i i did think he was involved in one of these experiments but i'll have to yeah revisit what exactly that was but he he had mental problems and he died from like beating up his own balls Yes. Right? He was brilliant. This is the education. I mean, uh, Hugh Hefner said he was Kinsey's pamphleteer. So he was a prophet of Kinsey. And this is where, um, you know, the kids are getting their education. We we talked a little bit about um, the Prussian system. And there was a whistleblower named Charlotte. Iserbeet. Iserbeet, yeah. She was amazing. She blew the whistle on the best uh, program. And that was essentially like what is now being used for SEL. It was the tech ed, the technology tech ed Mm -hmm. that they're they're using. So right now they're they're. I mean, that's in full force. They're using it to data mine children and then program them with the social emotional learning, which is all part of breeding these global citizens, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, They're it's a complete brainwashing tool but she was amazing her father and her grandfather were uh, both members of skull and bones mm. and so she had access to the the little black books essentially the rolodex mm-hmm. and she gave it to anthony sutton because he they were in touch because he was doing a uh, work uh research on the soviets and the cold war and uh he was starting to do research on the order of skull and bones and how they were involved in the education system. And so she, he asked her if he could have access to the, those books and he gave it to her. And that was her part of how he did all of his research. So, yeah. So look this up. Her 700 page report is called the deliberate dumbing down of America. Yep. And she served as senior policy advisor to the U S department of education under Reagan 
And then she un uncovered what UNESCO and these others were doing. And so look up the deliberate dumbing down of America by Charlotte Etherby. This one, it is a big book. Party has it. Whoa, yeah. look at all that blubber. <laughs> I, I got a used copy because nice. it's, a, it's a hard to find the unabridged version. Yeah. Uh, they they have mostly the abridged versions for sale, but I wanted the the full version. I've done actually a couple of shows on uh, the on Charlotte and how uh, she reveals like their plans. She talks about you know, she calls it communist core. It's not common core, communist mm -hmm. core. Mm -hmm. And uh, she talks about the uh, Carnegie Foundation's uh, documents. It was called the uh, conclusions and Recomm recommendations. Um, where they talk about how they're going to implement the com common core really to brainwash people and to to create these global citizens and so yeah saw on all of that yeah um another book on this topic is called pedagogy or the ministry of psychological reform by pascal bernardi and this deals with the un educational um or unesco's role in the transformation of education worldwide from a system based on academic instruction to one which the purpose is nothing but conditioning for acceptance of world government. Exactly like you said. Yep. Yeah. And and this uh, this comes out of, the, I always go back to Wilhelm Wundt because it was the Americanization of Wundt. That's what uh, Anthony Sutton calls it. Uh -huh. um, but it really was. And Wundt was a Hegelian. And as we explained, Hegel was a theosophist. Mm -hmm. uh, he was an alchemist and he was a hermeticist. Uh, but the most important thing, you know, not to get people too bogged down with because Hegel was pretty convoluted, uh, I think intentionally so, honestly. Um, but the most important thing to know about Hegel is he believed that you could not have freedom without subservience to the state. Mm. So it was all about the state was God for him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the uh, Sun does a really good job, I think, of actually really demystifying. He talks about, you know, how the Hegelian dialectic was weaponized in education. And I saw this firsthand <laughs> because I went to go and talk to our, uh, I went to the state capitol to, uh, you know, lobby against school choice because, you know, we already have school choice. Parents can choose to educate their children however they deem fit. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, in Tennessee, we actually have like less uh freedom parental rights than they do in several other states and uh, so they don't have true homeschooling freedom for for parents and so i they what but what they're trying to do through quote unquote school choice is give you government school choice mm -hmm. so really they want to put every child under the government control regardless of whether the parents are homeschooling them or not and not long story, not so short, but essentially I tried to explain to them because what they kept telling me was they said, we're the Republicans. So we're the good guys. I don't know why you see this as a problem. They're the bad guys. We're doing good. And I said, there's something called the Hegelian dialectic mm -hmm. and it's very effective. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I started out not saying that. What I actually started off saying was I don't really care if there's an R or D in front of this bill. What I care about is if you're expanding the government you're increasing the taxes, you're limiting parental rights, and you're controlling the children, um, and you're prohibiting our freedoms. I, that's what I care about. So I don't really care if it has a D on front of it or not. Um, but, and you're, of course, you know, miss up, you know, well, expanding uh, tax funding, ta taxpayers, uh, you know, funding. Yeah. Uh, but all of these things. And so, but then, so then he gave me this whole thing about how they're the good guys. And I said, well, so there's the Hegelian dialectic. And he says to me, are you using big words and we don't know what you're talking about oh, no. and and, uh, and I said that's okay let me you know I I won't give you like the whole long thing well just really the clip notes I can do this in like three sentences just uh -huh. to give you a little history lesson you know and uh, so I explained uh you know very simply the Hegelian dialectic and that this is the really simple just if people want like the clip notes is the first thing to keep in mind is that for Hegel the state is God and this is we see this right this is we see this especially through the education right this is dewey um this is of course uh g stanley hall who was the mentor to dewey this is Cantell. all of these really instrumental people in our education system and who you know we we get this unesco model from um but that's the first thing to keep in mind the second thing to keep in mind is that he when you know people hear like thesis and to the synthesis mm -hmm. but what hegel actually said because he that was ficka Ficke, who was another mystic, and I would argue he was a theosophist as well. Ficke was actually one of the first people 
uh, to envision an idea of the League of Nations. He and Kant both did. They had different visions of it. Um, and they called it different things. You know, one of them wanted it to be a league for perennial peace. And that's what Kant called it. Um, that, that wasn't the exact name, but that's essentially what it was. It was about perennial peace. And uh, Ficke really did envision more of a, what the League of Nations would be. And uh, he influenced Hegel, but he said that uh, he he was the one who like interpreted Kant's notion of the dialectic as being thesis, antithesis, synthesis. But Hegel wanted something that was more methodical. You know, really he wanted, he, he calls it a science, but it's really scientism. It's this way that he can, uh, you know, influence the historicity of man. He, he wanted to be one of these world historical figures. Uh, it sounds kind of like, you know, Madame Blavatsky. They, they the hierarchy, kind of, yeah. The hierarchy, exactly. And uh, he very much admired them. Like Napoleon was a, you know, huge uh, world historical figure to Hegel. Like he was uh, so impressive. Um, and uh, so he, what he actually said it was, was that it was the concrete, the negative, and then the abstract. Um, sorry, it was actually the opposite. The abstract, negative, concrete. And the reason this is important is because this is, this is the alchemical hermetic process. So mm -hmm have the abstract, which is this idea, he rejected uh, Kant and Ficke's interpretation of Kant and also Plato's notion of dialectic because he said that it was too intellectual. It was too abstract. He wanted something that could be used as a methodology. And <laughs> as this is, you know, they, they're, they're becoming gods, they're advancing history, you know, the, you know, the history of city of man. And so he says that it's the the concrete and then the negative, which the German word is Afhaven. And Afhaven is this very interesting oxymoronic term because it means to lift up and preserve while simultaneously canceling and tearing down. Mm -hmm. This is where we get Afhaven de culture, which mm -hmm. is a French school point, right? Then I don't think I need to explain cancel culture. Mm -hmm. um, but that, but it's really interesting because it is this oxymoronic, you have a shell of something, right? But they tear it down from within. And so that, that F haven is really the sublation, but you still have the elements of the earlier, uh, you know, uh, the, the abstract con uh, concept that, that emerges. And mm -hmm. then from there, you, it synthesizes into the concrete. They call it concretization. Mm -hmm. And this is really, it, it's just, it's important be, when people actually look at the spiral, uh, the Hegel, you know, he, the Hegelian spiral, mm -hmm. it actually looks like Jacob's ladder. I think he really thought, mm -hmm. you know, he was going to be, he was one of these, uh, he's going to be this guide to the history of man. He's, he's bringing you to heaven, heaven, which the early theosophists talked about. Mm -hmm. They talked about how this was a, uh, you know, they were going to be these conduits to bring you to, to Nirvana. God. Nirvana. Nirvana, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so I gave them the really, you know, like, I mean, that's a very reductionist, simple, I think we can all understand it. And they, they just told me, well, we're the good guys and you're using big words and they basically kicked me out. Everyone thinks they're the good guy. Did you remind them the Bushes were Republicans too? Look what happened. Yeah, I, we did, we didn't go there, yeah. but I thought it was really being very, um, I, I don't know. I thought it was being very diplomatic and gracious. And they, I, the rumor was that I, I was bad and I was not welcome back. <laughs> oh no, you're too smart. <laughs> <laughs> they were not happy. I know. But one of the women who I was there with was like, once, once you started talking about the Fabians and Hegel, I was like, we were, we're out of here. <laughs> oh, they were lost. <laughs> but these are, these are, you know, politicians who are supposedly very invested in education. You know what I really wanted to tell them? And I, I did say that, you know, there are many people throughout history who were not formally educated and, uh, you know, who have learned, you know, they were autodidactic and have done tremendous things. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are the people who are telling us how, how we should run our education system and, you know, what's beneficial for children. And apparently I really wanted to say, but of course I did not because I wanted to be polite, but I wanted to say, well, our education system has clearly failed you. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, know? you don't know them big words. <laughs> stop saying so, big words all i know is the words lobby uh, yeah i, know uh, lobby. Money. I like and, money exactly. i was just gonna say money <laughs> i like know that. yeah well and that's just it because it's all about these public private partnerships and you know they're getting all sorts of kickbacks that's the only thing i conclude from all of this is that they're getting all sorts of kickbacks 
to incentivize them through, because when you look at just at this example, but you see this from every angle, but of course with the school choice, now they, they're given these voucher money. And so through that, it, they're specific vendors. You think they just give you like $8,000 and now they're saying, well, we'll raise it to 12, whatever. Of course, it's not their money. So it, the, the number is arbitrary to them. Um, but you think they're just going to give you like a blank check and you do whatever you want with it? No, there's always strings attached. Whatever oh. the government funds, it runs. And so, of course, uh, they have the all these vendors tied to it. And this is, of course, what you're seeing, too, through through the UN, right? They're, yeah. they're creating all of these different public-private partnerships so that essentially all these different corporations who, if you take the the DEI and you, you take the ESG, you know, and you meet all of their various quotas, then you will get, you know, you you will become elevated and you'll get all of the benefits and yeah well speaking of government and sh war on children it just came out this week that um nestle is one of the biggest lobbyists for keeping paid maternity leave down mm -hmm. or next to nothing because if mom's at home with the baby she's not buying as much formula so they're losing money so yeah. they lobby to make the laws harder for you to stay home with your baby so they can sell more formula they're probably Nestle, having, like aspartame and lead in it or i don't know Nestle is so incredibly Mercury. evil so when i did all of that research on the knacks i was like trying to go back you know i was making the joke how i used to laugh that one day they were going to commodify the air we breathe <laughs> like somehow they were gonna but they kind of did that with water right they mm -hmm. the whole bottled water scam and mm -hmm. nestle was really instrumental in that that was a you know, so that they could profiteer off water. And then the, the NACs, that's what it's all about. It's about, they think that they're going to make upwards of four quadrillion, sorry, five quadrillion dollars through this. Yes, five quadrillion. That's a number we can't even fathom. Like it's just un inconceivable. And it, they think that they're going to make that through, essentially it's like carbon offsets and like carbon pricing. And, you know, like when Al Gore says like how the climate is, a uh, you know, a, a huge crisis and the earth is going to end in two years but even though he you know his home is like off you know the spewing the most carbon and he takes private jets everywhere it's okay <laughs> because he has bought a lot of carbon credits and so he's actually really doing good for the planet because he's bought so many carbon credits and I'm I just looked up who because I know Nestle sponsored a ride at Disneyland and they do it's called Soren. It's like a, yeah. a airplane simulation ride, I guess. Okay. I knew they had to be somewhere in, in the Disney. In Disney. Yeah, yeah. that's not a surprise. They yeah. were also part of, uh, yeah, they were one of the sub uh, partners in the Intrinsic Exchange Group. The Intrinsic Exchange Group only exists to create this lobby for the, the SEC and the New York Stock Exchange. But yeah. that's so crazy. So all of these Luciferian devil worshipers who are betting on this mass initiation let's look at um the final thing i had today which was the mural okay in the u.n security council chamber where the world leaders meet so in this little pamphlet uh there's not a very good th picture of the whole thing but there's this one kind of specific area i don't know if you can see so it's got like a man yeah and a woman and then you've got like a peter pan lucifer giving the fruit to the girl you see that and they're all in a vesica pisces so the exegesis that this book has uh, it says the young girl and boy represent unevolved man and woman so mankind is in the primitive state in the occult terms they are in the mineral vegetable animal state uh for them to evolve they have to know and that's when this little Peter Pan Lucifer in the form of a boy um, on top of the tree of life is offering the fruit to the little girl who then gives it to the man. He mm. is ready to partake. His eyes are <clears throat> opened and uh, he is willing to receive this gift. And then the child, they think out in front is, well, this person believes it's Cain which is a pretty deep esoteric uh, study in itself, the mark of Cain. Maybe we can talk about that some other time. 
but he's also holding a dove, which uh, in the occult represents the divine feminine or the goddess or Columbia, and also the portal, uh, which mankind comes through, life comes through, um, and also magic in the occult world comes through women. Were you going to say something? Yeah, no, no, you can go on. Um, but yeah, there that was really interesting in one of the theosophy books. I'm going to see if I can pull it up. Um, but one of the books that I had read, well, I don't know if I have it. Um, shoot. Yes, here it is. Um, oh, this is not the zoomed in version, but let me see. I might have it. Oh. well she they go through the like different types of magic of theosophy mm -hmm. and it was maybe i'll just do a quick search for it because it was great um i was hoping i had still had it pulled up i left it pulled up because i was yeah, going to so theosophy is not leaving out um all of the western and eastern mysticism so they are along with the major religions they are also rolling in um hermeticism rosicrucianism alchemy uh we talked about psychedelics. So it's just like literally everything in this big giant stew um, of Lucifer. And then, um, did you find what you're looking for yet? I did find it, but uh, no, it's the wrong one. It's, it's just so small, I can't read it. So I'm trying to find the a bigger. Oh, I think I did find it right here. Okay. Um, it's a book from, yes, yeah, so I'm going to have to find what page it was. And that's when they talk about like all is mind and mind power and um, Thelema is part of this too. But, you know, the, the mind stuff reminds me of like the Kybalion is becoming popular. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Mercury magic, witchcraft. I guess witchcraft is more under like animism and uh, folk magic. Mm -hmm. That's a part of this. Oh, that was really interesting too. Um, in that world uh, parliament, uh, the parliament of world religions, mm -hmm. uh, they were talking about how like they're it's giving credence to uh Wiccans, and that Wiccans is becoming like a much more popular religion, and uh, that you know it's becoming much more widely accepted. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was a, a good thing. The you ancient know. religion of Wicca, which started in the fifties. Okay, here it is. I found it. Okay, so they start with, um, and they say, okay, so adept magician is another word for tremendous significance and invites much investigation on account of frequent application on the hand to those who've most exalted and benefit acquirements. And on other hand, to those who basically pervert their power and work wonders, which results in disaster rather than in good to others and themselves. There are four typical kinds of magic, though, but two sorts are usually referred to in popular tre treaties. Red magic is the superlative power exercisable only by such as have passed through the ordeal by fire, the last and greatest of the four initiations. Hmm. White magic is all innocent use of psychic force, regardless of the measure or degree of power attained by whoever uses it. Gray magic is a semi-rightful and semi-wrongful exercise of the same power and is used wherever people desire and seek to cultivate psychic energy with mixed motives and for accomplishing dubious results. Black magic is simply selfish, soulless, inversion of the ability and invariably recoils upon its perpetrator in consequences of intense disaster. Um, yeah, so they then and then they go on. This book is fascinating. It was from like 1896. Uh-huh. So what, what's it called? It's a by Coville. It's a history of theosophy. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. So they've got all the colors of the wind in there in, in the 
they're colors of the magic remember that song from pocahontas which was a, a pretty new age animism movie disney's pocahontas yes and she's but singing like the the trees have a spirit and the rocks talk to me and the wind is a magic thing remember that i do remember that yeah that's a pretty theosophical song if you ask me apparently <laughs> so all these um, things and i think that's just it like you don't know you don't know what you don't know right so yeah it's like watching this i think they just become literally entra entranced right well, and so yeah. then they're very lured in and they have no idea they're under a spell they're under a spell yeah so last but not least uh the un is preparing for an arrival oh okay. yeah sometime between 2025 and okay. 2030 so literally next year um they say a great and new movement is proceeding and a tremendously increased interplay and interaction is taking place this will go on until ad 2025 during the years intervening between now and then very great changes will be seen taking place and at the great assembly of the hierarchy held as usual every century in 2025 the date in all probability will be set for the first stage of the externalization of the hierarchy. I know you've heard that before. Mm -hmm. the present cycle is called technically the stage of the forerunner. It is preparatory in nature, testing in its methods and intended to be revelatory in its techniques and results. You can therefore, you see therefore that Chohan's masters, initiates and world disciples and aspirants affiliated with the hierarchy are all at this time passing through a cycle of great activity so something is going to happen according to them in 2025 and this was written by alice bailey in 1946 yes. so alice bailey 1946 says something crazy is gonna pop off in 2025 so um stay tuned you guys because it's gonna get weird infinitely weird it's gonna get very weird so yeah. <laughs> um, I want to thank you so much, Courtney. You were perfect as usual. This was really fun. You're one of the smartest people I know, and you're welcome here anytime. And tell us where we can find all of your shows because I know you have like several. Yeah, I think I'm. I have uh, over 500 videos now, and I think I'm up to. I'm almost at episode 400 of interviews. Oh wow. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, a lot for the past few years. So yeah, it's at CourtneyTurner.com and I spell my name kind of weird. It's Courtney, C-O-U-R-T-E-N-A-Y-T-U-R-N-E-R.com. And uh, that's probably the best place to find me. And I'm on uh, social media, you know, it's pretty much at Courtney Turner, except Instagram is at Kinetic Quartz. Okay. And, and what is the very next show uh, project you're working on? Um, so I'm actually, so I started a radio show, so I'm doing, uh, I'm actually going to cover kind of a, I'm going to take some of this information and do a, a little overview. It'll be much more condensed kind of an overview of the history of theosophy. Okay. Um, and, uh, so I'm going to do a radio show. I'm doing, what do I have next? I have, I will have to look up because I have had, so I have my show Dangerous Dames. Um, and we are doing, uh, that's tomorrow I do with Dr. Lee Merritt. We do that every Monday. It airs at five. And uh, I believe tomorrow's episode is going to be on, we're having Paymon Matadeha come on. I know, is I know. Paymon? Yes. That's do a you, demon. You know what, Paymon's a demon? Yeah. Ooh. Well, I hope he's not a demon. Okay. <laughs> um, but he started, the Freedom, he started the Freedom Law School, which is okay. a, Maybe it's a Greek name or something, I don't, but I just know that from the Goetia. He, it might be. Um, yeah. He's, I believe he's Persian, but he just started the Freedom Law School, which is like a, he talks about, well, we, we thought it'd be very appropriate for tax day uh -huh. because he talks about like how all the codes actually say that you legally like don't 